I think your biggest contribution to your company is recruiting and retaining talent. Talent that is noticeably smarter and more skilled than you are as the leader, as the owner, which means you have to create some unnatural levels of humility to hire people that are noticeably more talented than you are and unleash them, get out of their way. Your job is to be the talent magnet, not the best at everything. Put that coffee down. Creators are leaders. Be careful what kind of leaders you're producing here. Helen, we're both in sales. Let me tell you why I suck as a salesman. They realize that to be in power, you didn't need guns or money or even numbers. You just needed the will to do what the other guy wouldn't. I'm not leaving. The show goes on. Well, hello there, friend. Welcome back to the Construction Leadership Podcast. I am your host, Bradley Hartman. Well, friend, if you have listened to this podcast at all, you hopefully have learned that I love what I get to do. I get to meet smart people and learn from them and hopefully ask halfway decent questions and occasionally share some laughs. And I've loved all the guests who've been on the show. However, Every now and then you get a guest who comes on and burns a little bit brighter. And that is the case with this episode. You, my friend, are in for a treat because you're going to hear my conversation with Mr. Scott Jeffrey Miller. And Scott came in hot right out of the gates. So who is Scott Jeffrey Miller? He's a sought after speaker, author, and podcast host. He's the Wall Street Journal bestselling author, and he currently serves as Franklin Covey's Senior Advisor on Thought Leadership. Prior to his advisor role, he was a 25-year Franklin Covey associate serving as their Chief Marketing Officer and Executive Vice President. He also hosts On Leadership with Scott Miller, the world's largest weekly leadership podcast, and C-Suite Conversations with Scott Miller. Both of those I strongly recommend to a friend. And yes, he has a much larger audience than ours, and I've learned a lot from him as a host, and he has some of the most amazing guests, many of which, if you are a book reader and you're in business, you got business books, a lot of those people who wrote those are on his show, and you can learn from them in a very entertaining and insightful way. But that's not all. He's also a co-founding partner in Gray and Miller, a speaking literary and talent agency. So I was thrilled to have him on the show specifically to talk about his new book, The Ultimate Guide to Great Mentorship, 13 Roles to Making a True Impact. It came at a really good time for me and our business as we are growing, not only within our organization, but also just with our coaching clients. And as our industry gets better at leadership, with these multi-generational teams that we have, a book like this, The Ultimate Guide to Great Mentorship, is extremely valuable because it's practical. It's very prescriptive. It tells you what to do. So I'm not going to ramble on anymore because this was a ton of fun to record and you're going to learn he's smart and he's funny and I would strongly recommend you just buy a case of these books. They're going to help you be a better mentor a better leader, and they're also going to help develop better mentees. So all across the board, you're going to gain from this. So without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Mr. Scott Jeffrey Miller. As always, thank you for listening. Scott Jeffrey Miller, welcome to the show. Bradley, thank you for the spotlight and the honor. I'm delighted to be here today, truly. I can't wait to talk about your book, which you can see, you know what I had to do, mainly because one of the first pages has one of the most incredible, ridiculous lines I've ever read on the written page. We're going to close with that, but I've got them not only on the periphery here, I had to go on the top too. So this book came along for me at just the right time. I got to improve my own mentorship. But before this, tell me, place me where you were geographically. Maybe what was going on with the family environment when you were 12 years old and you were in sixth grade? What were you into? Tell me about Scott Jeffrey Miller. Was he going by three names at 12? Tell me about that. What the heck? (laughs) I love it. (laughs) Sixth grade. I was living in Winter Park, Florida, going to a public school. Nervous as heck about moving up to the middle school campus. I was probably playing baseball at my father's mandate because he thought that's what all his boys should do. I was probably wishing I was a better tennis player. 
I was probably serving the mass at the local Catholic church more than I wanted at the time and probably was doing something naughty with all my guy friends down at the lake, hiding stuff on bushes that we would, you know, anyway, enough about that. What six year old, six, anyway, I was a good Perfect kid. Answer. I was a good kid. I was raised in a very stable, healthy, upper middle class family in central Florida in the seventies. I'm very grateful to my parents for providing that environment for me. Siblings? How many did you have? One brother, older, genius, MBA okay. from MIT, CEO of two Amazon-owned companies, IQ of 800, and introvert. So we're the exact opposites, and we're great friends. What? Hat tip to your parents. What did they uh-huh. do? MIT, Amazon-owned companies, and you? I mean, we're- Me? Whatever about quite me. Quite frankly, I'm not going to brag about you to your face, but I'm going to, on the intro, the audience will have already listened to all that you've accomplished. So whatever they were doing, whatever they were cooking- was effective. Oh, I'm a slacker compared to my brother. He's the real deal. So that explains you worked for the celebration company. You worked at Walt Disney. What were some of the insights? What did you learn from that early job experience? Oh, I'm a raving fan of the Walt Disney company. I'm not a big consumer of their products. We don't go to their theme parks for no reason other than we live in the Mountain West and tend to do things out here. But I learned about the quality standard at Disney. Disney has an extraordinary onboarding program around guest services, how to treat your guests. So I think my customer service hallmark, I was you know, the CMO of a public company for a decade and how we built systems and customer service focused mindset clearly came from my years at Disney. Although I think I entered Disney having worked in the restaurant industry for four or five years, you know, through high school and college. I think I've always been service minded. I learned a lot about how to treat customers and own the problem, whether it's your problem or not, whether it's your job or not, own it to the end. I have nothing but great things to say about my experience at the Walt Disney Company, including their decision to invite me to seek employment elsewhere. <laughs> Understood. You mentioned college. I had to ask you. We have a little, uh, uh, I don't do it all the time. But Princeton. I'm gonna do it I went to Princeton for undergrad. Rollins College. Stanford for grad. I'm kidding. <laughs> Rollins College. The mascot is? The Tars, I think. The Tars. <laughs> I don't know. Who cares? I don't know. I don't know. The TARS. It's like a private liberal arts school in Florida where you mortgage your home to send your kid to (laughs) while they drink beer and get naughty. I don't know. I have the TARS. The TARS. I think it's the TARS. With one R or two? I don't care. This doesn't sound right. Bradley, I don't know (laughs) or care. (laughs) I like you in spite of that question. I have no idea what the mascot is of the university I went to, but all right. Good it wasn't, talk. First Next of all, question. it wasn't a university. It was a college. So, which meant their mascot <laughs> probably didn't matter anyway, because they had like a water skiing team. I mean, <laughs> it wasn't like a division one football school. I'm literally Googling this while you ask. I went to the university of Illinois, so I don't know either. So we'll leave it. Okay. I will tell you this. You then moved on to Franklin Covey, 2001. Chicago land. I'd been working for a national home builder for probably 15 months, had no idea what I was doing, getting my ass kicked on time management. And somebody said, listen, go to the store. There it is. Rollins. It's an anchor. It's not, <laughs> the tars. it's not the tars. It ain't the tars. <laughs> like the sailors, the seamen, maybe it's the midshipmen. I don't know. It's not the tars. <laughs> I'll tell my you that. favorite interview <laughs> ever. <laughs> so I go, he, this guy says my mentor, as a matter of fact, he goes, listen, on the way home, you're going to go by Schaumburg. This was when there was a retail store for Franklin Covey planners. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I go in there and he goes, buy the biggest one, buy it. It's going to be a black leather. It's going to cost you $150. And it's it's like also going to have back. a retractable handle in it also. <laughs> There's a lot going on. I will tell you this. It changed my life and I became a disciple. That really Got me, helped me put my life together, at least some basic organization and construction. You've been there 27 plus years, right? You were chief marketing officer. Tell me about what it's like to be in there because you were in the belly of the beast. Tell me what that was like. Well, thank you for your compliment. I joined the company about 28 years ago, spent 25 years with them, retired from the firm three years ago in good standing. I'm now an ambassador for the company and I advise them on strategy. But as you know, as an officer of a public company, you can't have a garage sale. You can't make a political contribution. There's things I wanted to do. So we, I left in really great standing. Phenomenal opportunity. Dr. Covey himself recruited me out and mentored me for many years prior to his passing. He was the real deal. His a book, of course, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, sold 50 million copies, has changed hundreds of millions of people's careers 
in the organization. We divested ourselves of the planning division about 15 mm -hmm. years ago. So the Franklin Planner, believe it or not, it's still a robust tool and millions of people buy them, but it's not part of our company. We're proud of that legacy. Hiram Smith was the inventor of that, but really had an amazing journey. You know, being a little bit of an uncertain leader inside of a leadership company, I learned a lot about what to do and not to do and what to apologize for. A lot of those are along my journey but really have nothing again but enormously positive comments to talk about Franklin Covey, the sterling brand when it comes to developing leadership skills in any organization. Absolutely. Tell me a little bit about own your mess. What does that mean? So I have authored seven books, published six. The seventh one comes out in February. My most recent, of course, being The Ultimate Guide to Great Mentorship. My first book, was called Management Mess to Leadership Success, 30 Challenges to Become the Leader You Would Follow. And this was a little bit of an unpopular book in the leadership industry. It sold extraordinarily well to the marketplace because most leadership books, as you know, Bradley, they glamorize leadership and they lure people into leadership and everyone should be a leader. I'm like, no, no, no. Not everyone should be an anesthesiologist. Not everyone should be a commercial airline pilot. And for sure, as heck, not everyone should be a leader of people, including me, quite frankly. Some people are lured into leadership, right? The best salesperson oh, yeah. applies to be the sales leader, and this is the wrong job for them. And so my premise of the book, Own Your Mess, is kind of the tagline of management mess to leadership success. I've gone on to write a series of books in that mess to success, but I just believe fundamentally, to answer your question, we learn more from people's messes than we do their successes. I don't have your personality, your good looks. I don't have your Ivy League education or your wife's dressed fun. I sure as I don't have that awesome head of hair you have, but I can navigate around your messes if you're willing to describe them for me. So I believe everyone should own your mess. You know what? People know what your messes are. Everybody can guess everybody's credit score. Everybody knows what your sexuality is. Everybody knows what your fears are and your jealousies are. Why not just talk about them? Own your mess. Because when you own your mess as a leader, you make it safe for others to own theirs and own up to them. So where does the phrase that I hear a lot of like, hey, you can lead from anywhere. And I'm like, generally, I agree. We hire someone right out of school and they come in. They don't know much. Yes, they have fresh eyes. They can see things without any biases or because this is the way we've always done it. Yet also, <laughs> commercial airline pilot, anesthesiologist, whatever, proctologist. Yes, not everyone should do those. Scott, how does that match up with that mindset that, you know what? No, not everyone should be a leader. Where do those cross, if at all? Well, most importantly, did you say proctologist? That's right. I swear that's a strange profession. Who chooses that, damn it? Okay, can you lead from anywhere? I mean, it's a lovely social media post, but what is that about? Yes, you can lead culture. Don't gossip. Make and keep commitments. Offer excuse-free apologies. Take the blame when you dropped the ball. I guess that's leading from anywhere. Yes, can you lead yourself? Yes, can you lead a project? But I don't believe everyone should be a leader of people. I mean, I guess in a debate, I might lose in a nuanced argument about everyone's a leader informally. But that's really not what we're talking about in life. What we're talking about is who should formally lead other people? Who should be the person that apprises your competencies and whether or not you get a raise or a promotion? Who should give you high courage feedback on your blind spots? Who should be sitting you down and having a high courage conversation that doesn't diminish your self-esteem or your self-worth? But in fact, the intent is to lift you up and build your influence and make you aware of your blind spots. That's a special breed of people. Not everyone should be a leader of people. And that's okay. Every company needs about 90% of people not to be leaders of people. And in fact, to actually do the work and be the individual contributors. The problem is too many organizations lure usually the most creative digital designer or the most efficient dental hygienist, right? Or the most organized administrator. And now all of a sudden they become the office manager and they're wrecking havoc on the culture because they don't know how to lead people. Not because they're a bad person, they're a bad leader, typically because they weren't trained is the problem. So I guess someone can parse it out to everyone can lead from anywhere. I think it's a bunch of nonsense. When I'm talking about leadership, I'm talking about who is it you report to? 
Because people don't quit bad jobs. They quit bad leaders in corrupt cultures. People quit bad leaders. You don't quit because some colleague down the hall didn't do rah-rah at some event and lead from any other place. You quit because your leader sucks. I'm thrilled I asked the question because I love the <laughs> distinction. I hear people I just like repeating stuff. It. No, actually, I feel, yes, you haven't even thought about it. I think that felt really off the cuff to me. Tell me about your first mentor. Did you seek it out? Did somebody pull across the not yet Scott Jeffrey Miller when you were to Scott and be like, hey, Scott, let me, what was that first mentorship relationship for you? I think my first formal mentor was my 10th grade civics teacher, Mr. Romeo, Sam Romeo. He also was the student council sponsor. And I was, of course, student body president in high school, but I joined student council and he really guided me at an awkward time in my life. And so I think Sam Romy was my first formal mentor. But my first informal mentor was a man named Bruce Williams, who really popularized talk radio back in the 70s and 80s. Bruce Williams had a radio program called the Bruce Williams Show, like long before Rush Limbaugh, long before Sally Jesse Raphael and Sean Hannity and the rest of the ones on the right and the left. And he was sort of a small town entrepreneur mayor. And every night he had a 6 to 9 p.m. Eastern time radio call-in program. I'm looking to buy a house. What kind of insurance do I need? I've inherited $10,000. What do I do with it? Right? Kind of general entrepreneurial business stuff. And so I listened to Bruce Williams while well, most of my contemporaries in sixth grade were listening to NXS and Duran Duran, I was the nerd listening to Bruce Williams for three nights a week, but he had a profound impact on me for upwards of a decade. What's interesting is Bruce Williams died a few years ago, having no idea Scott Miller was even alive, soon to write a best-selling book called The Ultimate Guide to Great Mentorship, proving you don't have to know your mentor. You don't have to have a relationship that could be your favorite author or your favorite speaker or podcast host, Bradley. You don't have to know your mentor. You just have to name them as your mentor and then suck the life out of their wisdom and apply it in your own. That's awesome. Well, we'll come back to there because I've learned an absolute ton from your significantly more popular, for obvious reasons, on leadership podcast. But we'll Obvious because of my that. interviewing skills or my set or just my IQ. I mean, come on, call it out. I've got a pie chart. I've broken it out mathematically. A lot of it is the good looks in the host. Yes. But let's continue. There we go. We set the stage. I love it. Let's talk about the ultimate guide to great mentorship. Hold on. Hold on. This is important for your listeners because not everyone is watching this podcast. This guy looks like a freaking million bucks. I mean, it is. (laughs) This guy, his hair is combed flawless. He's shaved. I look like I just came off a booze cruise. I mean, you're you're like the real deal. (laughs) (laughs) 370 episodes. This is the first time someone has said booze cruise on the show. By the way, you know what? You know what I think we need to do is before the mic slipped on, share with our audience <laughs> when I complimented you on the nice background, which have all your books, they're all lined up, right? And you commented on the books that are behind me. Scott, if you would, share with the audience what you said to me. It has nothing to do with booze or a cruise. <laughs> I just, complimented you on how well read you were from the vast selection of books behind you. That's exactly how it went. That's a lie. I said, hey, that's really nice. It's, it's one of the best backdrops you've seen. You said, well, yours is nice too, but I've written mine. And I was like, oh, oh, it's going to be one of these Friday afternoon podcast episodes. All right. Looking forward to it. Seriously though, the ultimate guide to great mentorship, 13 roles to making a true impact. The thing that jumped out to me immediately, Scott, is that Oftentimes, I think when it comes to me trying to be a mentor with my team or coaching some folks that are clients, I might not be prior to this book even aware that I need to play different roles. I show up as me with any good, bad, and otherwise, and I'm me versus thinking I need to be adaptable and flexible as we work through this relationship together. So I want to dive into three roles specifically to give some context But maybe just tell us about how this developed. How did you come up with this list of 13 roles that you want someone to try to navigate through? Bradley, genuinely, I think your description of your approach is what everyone has, right? Is you sort of bring your whole self and that can be well intended, but it also can be very intimidating. I mean, all joking aside, right? You obviously are a well-read individual. You have an extraordinary command of the English language. You're very confident in your ability to express your opinions and on and on and on, right? You've had a great career. 
And the fact of the matter is that can be very intimidating to a lot of people. It can diminish people accidentally. It can actually encourage your mentee to want to sort of become you, which may or may not be their path. So it's very important to be mindful of your presence. I wrote mm -hmm. this book. Well, first of all, Harper Collins asked me to write it, which is an honor for any publisher to come to an author. They wrote it because they felt like the marketplace needed a very practical mentorship book. There were lots of aspirational, ethereal mentorship books, but not a do this and say that kind of book. So they came to me and said, Scott, you want to write a book on mentorship? I said, yes. I said, I think there are 15 roles. They passed out. They came back too and said, no, there can't be 15 of anything. Have you ever heard of the seven habits of high effective people? <laughs> yes, I worked there. So with grand compromise, I took it from 15 down to 13. And I do think these are 13 roles that mentors can play. Sometimes they underplay them. Sometimes they overplay them. I wrote the book because generally speaking, mentors hail from leadership and not all the same competencies that make you, Bradley, a great leader, make you a great mentor. And so I wrote the book very prescriptively. Here's when you might want to be in this role. Here's when you're tempted to overplay that role. The point is not that as a mentor, you're going to play 13 roles in a phone call or a meeting at Starbucks or over five meetings, but just to be mindful of when you're in a circumstance with a mentee, perhaps you'll have an awareness of, should I be doing more of this or less of that? Yeah. And you mentioned it early on, which I think it's in some way it's obvious. However, it's obvious in logic, not behavior is that there's a lot of little nuance. And if you've ever been and we're like, dude, this is a really good conversation. They're getting it. They're getting it. I love this mentor role. And then all of a sudden they say something and I'm like, where the hell did that come from? Did you not listen to a word I just said? And so to your point, some of these are similar roles, but I think you're exactly right. And some of these I'm like, yes, I totally relate to that. Yeah. Never even occurred to me. So yeah, there's a lot of nuance. And I think maybe this is the understatement of the year, Scott. I think we're living in an age where sometimes nuance is lost a little bit, whether this is in social media or on TV or anything else. But there's a lot of little nuance in here. And that's why I, quite frankly, I haven't, haven't read anything really similar to this. What you're saying is my book had a watershed experience with you. It was an epiphany that has changed the trajectory of your mentorship forever. That's what I heard. That is on a business card somewhere around here. But yes. <laughs> okay, I, I think three roles. Right. Three roles you want to dive into. <laughs> there we go. All right. I am now Let's officially hijacked it. Bradley's podcast, not the role of a guest, by the way. All right, here we go. We're going to start with number one, the revealer. I'm going to read to you the words that you wrote. Okay. The revealer works like a paleontologist, delicately brushing away the metaphorical dust and debris to reveal the mentee's passions, talents, fears, and goals. We, as you know, are a construction audience. Sometimes the delicate brushing away of things are lost in some folks in our industry that are coming everything with a hammer and a nail. Why is this role number one and why is it so important? Well, again, I'm going to pay you a compliment. I just want you to own it. You and I have a lot in common, right? My sense is we have a strong sense of self-confidence. You obviously are an extraordinary communicator, perhaps me less so. But Bradley, there's no question your level of confidence and experience is going to intimidate someone. And some people will find that offensive. Some will become defensive. Some may feel marginalized or minimized. The role of a mentor is to help validate people and name their genius and be a light, not a judge, be a model, not a critic. So quite frankly, if I was 25 and you were mentoring me and you came at me with your personality, I would think, oh my goodness, you know, how am I going to impress this guy? How am I going to hold my own? You know, his ability to talk extemporaneously is intimidating to me. So I think it's important as the revealer to just be mindful. What is it like to be on the receiving end of feedback from you? What's it like to be in a meeting with you? What's it like to be on a construction site? What's it like to ride to a job site with you? And just to be mindful that... Your presence, your voice, your personality, your business acumen, your knowledge, your professional success can diminish others even accidentally, whether you mean to or not. And if you're trying to have a positive impact on someone, you want to make them become comfortable being uncomfortable. You don't want them to try to take on your personality or lie to you or oppress to you. That's the counterintuitive. Now, some people might say, no, I just, I am who I am, like it or don't. Well, then great. Then go live in Bermuda where on an island or somewhere because you're not going to have any influence. At the end of the day, it's about calibration and self-awareness. If you've got someone that may not have the same journey that you do, be thoughtful because if you're trying to have an impact, you want them to have an open mind and an open heart 
and not maybe become defensive or be someone you're not. This is called influence. This is about aligning yourself with emotional intelligence and principles of human behavior and asking myself, how am I going to have an influence on Bradley? Is my energy and attention, vocabulary, the rate, the tone, the pitch, the cadence of my voice, my hand gestures, my physical presence, is this putting him in the conditions where he can choose to have a vulnerable and impactful conversation with me? That's what you're trying to do as a revealer. Your job is to uncover their genius and their goals so that they can discover them, name them, and hopefully accelerate their path toward them through your own wisdom and experience. Well, what jumped out at me as you were talking there is what I hadn't realized before, though, is the mentors in my life that have changed my life are the ones that saw something in me that I didn't see in myself, right? And like, that's kind of what you were describing is like, that's your role is to come in. And if it's super obvious, well, then there's probably something else there. Bradley, is one of your three in your list the validator? It is not. Let's talk about it though. 30 seconds. I actually think this is the most consequential of all of the 13 roles. Not the hardest or not the most frequently abused, the most consequential. Everyone in life has had someone who named our genius. I can tell a long mm-hmm. story. I'm a stutterer. I have a very debilitating speech impediment, have my whole life braces three times, Invisalign twice. I have two speech coaches, speech pathology. There are 35 words I cannot say in public. In the winter, it goes to about 150 words. I have worked for nearly 45 years to overcome this debilitating speech impediment. And once when I was 17, I had a customer at a restaurant stop me after asking for directions to a hair salon and tell me, you have an amazing command of the English language. This is going to take you far. This is your superpower. She told this to a 140 pound, six foot tall, 16 year old that could barely put four words together in public. I was a stutterer. She was my validator. I've got on to host a podcast and a radio program. I speak for a living. I'm a stutterer. The role of validator is exactly what you said. It is judiciously with thoughtfulness and care, not with common frequency, but with rarity taking a pause and with great deliberation, naming your mentee's genius and doing it so clearly that they come to believe it in themselves. And maybe like a golf club, they may not use the iron right there in the putting green, but they're going to put it back in their club and use it sometime later when someone jackass is kicking their ass and their self-esteem is low. And they got to pull that club back out that Bradley mentioned to them three months, three years, three decades earlier. The role of the validator is the most consequential of all 13 roles. Don't overuse it. Is that the biggest risk, what you just said there at the end, where I come in, I'm like, all right, all right, how do I change someone's life today, right? No, you're not doing that. You're not validating that they showed up on time or that they look great or taking good notes. You're You're listening for their genius. And then when it comes time, you say, Bradley, I want to take a pause for a moment. I want to pay you a compliment and I don't want you to artificially dispute it or brush it away. In fact, I don't want you to even comment on it. I just want you to listen to me. I've been watching and listening to you and I have noticed, Bradley, that X, Y, and Z. And I name it with great specificity and I've written down three or four times when I have seen this manifest in Bradley's behavior so that he comes to own it. And I say, now, Bradley, like all of our strengths, If we overplay them, they can become weaknesses. So be careful about calibration, right? Turn the volume down when needed on this skill. But I guarantee you, Bradley, whatever as I said, he will carry that with him the rest of his life if it's specific, genuine, and done in a moment, punctuated by a pause. Thanks for letting me share that. No, thank you. And you've done this twice now, and I am working on it. I, Scott, as you can assume, am still a work in progress. But oftentimes people will pay someone a compliment and people will, they'll try to talk it away. And you both twice you've said, Hey, I'm going to pay you a compliment. I just want you to accept it. Why is this a, such a hard thing for humans to do to just accept a compliment and say, thank you. That means a lot to me. Not being a mental health therapist or a psychiatrist, I think it's most of us aren't on the end of a lot of compliments in life, right? I mean, I think a lot of us have been beaten down by our parents beaten down by our ministers or priests or rabbis or school headmasters or professors or teachers. My teachers were always incredibly hard on me. 
I felt like an idiot in junior high school and college. I had maybe two professors I can remember that ever validated me. I don't think we receive it that much. And when we do, maybe we're suspect. We think it's disingenuous. I don't think enough people in life did what I modeled, which is to slow down and listen and think for several encounters. What is Bradley's genius? I mean, one of your geniuses, honest to God, is your energy, right? I mean, I think you know when to deploy it. You know when to hold it back. You know when to use it for your guest benefit. I think your ability to calibrate your, like me, almost unbridled energy is a huge talent you have. And I'm sure it can fatigue some people. I'm sure it motivates other people. I don't think enough of us have had enough feedback and we're maybe a little bit suspicious when someone gives it to us or we have a little bit of false humility. We feel a bit embarrassed. But when you give someone a compliment, say to them, I just want you to own it. And I don't want you to dispute it. I don't want you to give someone else credit for it. I want you to own it. And I want you to think about how this can become an asset for you going forward and occasionally when it might become a liability if you were to overplay it. That's powerful. And I also think that's it's actionable. That's something that I can do. I feel like I've done maybe part of it, but certainly not all of it. I haven't thought about this way. I'm going to jump to number five, the challenger here. The challenger tactfully pushes their mentee to confront assumptions, perspectives, mindsets, or behaviors that are impeding their performance. I highlighted and underlined this one for a reason. They determine the level of confrontation that will be helpful given the mentee and the situation. There's a lot of people in life they do not like or want to engage in confrontation or conflict. There are other people that I think are on the other side of the spectrum like me where, hey, let's do this. If we have a problem, let's attack this head on. Tell me about the challenger role and maybe, you know, some of the risks or the opportunities in there. 30 years in the leadership business, everybody listen up. I think a leader or mentor's number one job is to recruit and retain talent. That is your number one job. Not mission, vision, values, not systems, structures, and strategies. Yes, do those things. I think your biggest contribution to your company is recruiting and retaining talent. Talent that is noticeably smarter and more skilled than you are as the leader, as the owner which means you have to create some unnatural levels of humility to hire people that are noticeably more talented than you are and unleash them, get out of their way. Your job is to be the talent magnet, not the best at everything. That's your number one job. I think your number two job as a leader is to give people feedback on their blind spots, is to move outside of your comfort zone and discuss the undiscussables. And if you are a more shy, retiring person who avoids conflict and won't have high courage conversations, then you don't deserve to be a leader of people because you need to become a transition figure and those who work for you to have difficult conversations about their punctuality, about their character, about their competence, about their hygiene, about their interpersonal skills, about anything and everything that will make them a better contributor to your culture and your bottom line in the workplace. You have to be able to build the discipline. Now, I think the problem is most people are cowards. And that's not a character flaw. That's a personality trait. People say to me, Scott, you're so good at it. Yeah, I came out of my mother's womb having high courage conversations. No, I screwed up the first 400 of them, which is why my human resource file is an expandable folder because I screwed up the first 400. But like any muscle, you're going to work about it and you're going to role play a delicate balance of courage and diplomacy. Most of us will be like me, where I seek conflict. I love conflict. I love to debate. Let's go have a beer. My wife's like, have a beer? Get the hell out of my face. I don't want to see you for two days, right? I kind of bruise hard and heal fast, and not everybody does. Unlike my wife, who is Switzerland, everyone loves my wife because she wears the white hat. I love my wife too, but she wants no conflict and therefore offers no opinions, which is why every dinner party... The drive home is long with her kicking my ass about, oh, you had to go there with Trump. You told me you wouldn't. The point is, I didn't say positive or negative. I just said the word. So as a mentor in the role of a challenger, you need to be able to practice courage balanced with diplomacy. And when you are showing that courage, it goes like this. Bradley, I'd like to stop for a moment and I want to give you some feedback on what you just said. First, I want to declare my intent. Bradley, my intent is not to diminish you or to embarrass you. It's not to negatively impact your career. In fact, it's the opposite. 
Bradley, I'm going to give you some high courage feedback so that you can expand your influence exponentially inside of our company. Bradley, I noticed that during the weekly meeting, you get the point, right? I first declared my intent. And you might even say, Bradley, listen, I don't have all the facts. And I might not use the right words. In fact, I might even need a do-over on this conversation. Don't judge me by the words I use. Judge me by my intent. My intent is to help you see a blind spot that you have. We all have them. I have them. But I want to give you, you get the point, right? And that's the role of the challenger is to stop someone when they're perhaps thinking or behaving in a way that is counterintuitive to what their goals are as a mentee or an employee. What you did great in this book is literally give them the words to say, like diplomacy. And then you said, say this. I was like, I can say that. Or you know what? I'm going to tweak a couple words, but I can own that. But it seems very prescriptive, right? And actually, I'm going to jump in here for a minute. I, I saved it to the end. I would say this is less, I mean, it is a book, obviously. Undeniably, this is a book. It's also a system. Can you share with our audience what you did and why there are QR codes in every single chapter here? Because this, I gave it to my team and I'm like, we're idiots. Why aren't we doing this? This is brilliant. What do you do with the QR codes that are in the book? That's gracious of you to ask. So if you visit greatmentorship.com, you'll see a variety of videos. So at the end of each of the 13 roles, 13 chapters, 13 roles, there's a, a QR code that goes to my website that just shows, I don't know, a short one or two minute video that talks about the nature of the role. They're not, you know, earth shattering productive videos, but it just kind of gives you the big idea of which of the roles that you're reading about, kind of recaps the big idea, just to maybe even put some words in someone's mouth that they want to actually play that role. I actually launched a certification program with 13 videos that are like five minutes a piece. People can become certified as a mentor. You can find that also at greatmentorship.com. But it was to also allow the visual learner that really might like, might like to see me in practice. I don't role play them, but I just give you a short synopsis in video and audio of what that role is really intended to do with your mentee. Yeah. No, you're reading it. I just hold up my phone. Thank right? you, Bradley. Put the QR code. I go right there. I watch them. So it really became for me, and I'm a visual learner, to go back and forth to the audio and the video in there and then the book. I thought that was smart. I feel like you're validating me right now, and I appreciate that. Look at you, think quick learner. part of your genius. I'm jumping to talking about celebration, the closer, roll 13. This, which I think you mentioned this earlier, I think you and I have some character traits that are similar here. Let me establish, I don't think we celebrate winning enough in life, like the legitimate achievement of tough goals. Take me, for example, not me, you. At the time of this book's release, I will be just turning 55. In the past three years, I've authored and released seven books. Many of them are bestsellers. I never celebrate. I'm too busy, too concerned, something. How do you overcome that? Because I, as I read that, I'm like, I mean, other than the best-selling author part, amen. Yes. I'm like, yeah, I wrote a book. I was a year late on it. And now I'm, I'm tiltic. I'm behind on the next one, right? How do we overcome this? Because it seems silly. Why don't we like to celebrate? Again, not a psychiatrist, but I know that I spent the majority of my career in a public company, which meant I, which meant I spent 25 years, a hundred quarters, a hundred quarters of being analyzed by the analyst and whether or not we hit the EBITDA that they thought I should or we should, right? No joke, a hundred quarters. Those 25 years took 25 years off my life. Typically, sales leaders set goals super high and they often crush people. And what happens is if you actually accomplish the goal, then often the leader thinks it was set too low that you phoned it in. When you, you gave everything you had, well, I can tell you of those hundred quarters, I'm not sure we actually met or exceeded eight of them. It took a toll on me, it took a huge psychological toll on me. I felt like a loser. I don't think we hit eight of a hundred quarterly goals that the leader set for us. Now, maybe the marketplace thought we did, but it was psychologically devastating. Everyone wants to win. I don't want to be rewarded for coming to work on time. I don't want to be rewarded for shaving. Well, today I would lose, you would win. But I want to have stretch goals that make me bring my all. But when I actually slide into the finish line and win, man, I want a celebration. And I want to celebrate how I want to celebrate, not how you want to celebrate. I don't want two tickets to, to the movie theater. I don't go to the movie theater, right? I want you to care enough about me to celebrate the way I want to celebrate. One of the best books ever written is by Dr. Gary Chapman, The Five Love Languages. And this book is about relationships and what is one of your five love languages. 
I'll get them wrong, but physical touch, acts of service, quality time, words of affirmation, and something else. Go buy the book, The Five Love Languages. Similarly, in your organization, in your construction company, everybody has a different language on how they want to be validated, how they want to be treated. And it used to be that as leaders, we could have one style of leadership and everybody had to cleave to it. Well, newsflash, that's gone. The pandemic, the recession, Black Lives Matter, social justice, Me Too, it all stopped. And now as leaders, you have to bring what is an individualized style of leadership to the workplace. Because how Bradley wants to be led and talked to is different than how Scott wants to be led and talked to. Now, you can treat people different and still treat them fairly. You can still treat people equitably and still treat them differently. But as you're talking to people, you've got to modify your style and lead them differently. I think it's important that you think as you're a leader and a mentor, how are you able to calibrate your style to make sure it hits your mentee or your employee where it needs to be? We use that word calibration a couple of times. And as you've used it, I think you coupled it before with kind of turn up the volume or turn down yeah. the volume. And I think in certain aspects of our life, that comes easier. And other places, it like it doesn't, right? We're different people in different environments. I'm actually not very good at it, which is why I repeat the word for myself. I mean, I give a lot of keynotes to 7,000 people. And I use the same level of voice on that stage as I do driving in the car with my wife two feet next to me. My wife said to me, why are you screaming? I'm not screaming. Because this is my natural voice level. This seems like, <laughs> like my diaphragm is like doing trampling contractions, but I don't even notice. This is actually very unnatural. I don't feel in control. I feel quite weak. Now that I am doing it for more than four seconds, I feel a little more calm and credible. But I actually think I'd probably have a lot more Instagram followers if I wasn't always screaming at everybody. Living in all caps. All right. To be very clear, we had you on our leadership podcast because it is so much smaller than your leadership podcast. I'm going to read a series of names. I just want you to listen to these names and I'm going to ask a question. Are you ready? Good. Simon Sinek, Patrick Lencioni, Lencioni, Tomato, tomato, moving on. Ariana Huffington, Seth Godin, Marie Forleo, James Clear, Matthew McConaughey, Ursula Burns, James Patterson, Guy Raz, Nancy Duarte, Jason Derulo. I love all these people. You have spoken and interviewed them all. What stands out to you? Are there certain maybe non-obvious character traits or something of these really incredible people that you've been able to spend time with? My answers may be underwhelming, but they're very well thought through because I'm actually asked this question with some frequency. One is they all have an insane work ethic, insane work ethic. That doesn't mean they don't have, they don't mean they're workaholics. Uh, they don't have unbalanced lives, but they're super hard workers. Yes, everyone's trying to work smarter, but these people get up and they crank it out. They know when their peak, their trough and their recovery is. They know, like me, my peak is 4 a.m. to 10.30 in the morning. It's when I do all my hard work, have all my high courage conversations, do the majority of my hard intellectual work. I then go into a bit of an energy trough. Yes, I hear me, 4 a.m. to 10.30. I am at it, which means, yeah, I may be having employee calls at 6.30 in the morning, if that makes sense. 10.30 to 1.30, I'm in a bit of a trough. I'm not sleeping, but I'm not doing you know intellectually intense things. I'm having lunch meetings. I'm not making valuable decisions. I'm signing expense reports. I'm sending emails. I'm posting on social. And then I have a bit of recovery from about two to about seven. And then I crash at 930 at night. Crash. Like I'm out asleep at 930. Bounce like a jackrabbit four in the morning, seven days a week. One is they're super hard workers. They know their peak, their trough, and their recovery, and they organize their schedules around their natural energy level, known as your circadian cycle. Secondly, and I hope this isn't found to be underwhelming, is none of them are overnight successes. There's no such thing as overnight success. There is overnight fame, and it's often ill-gotten and fleeting. But these people that, you know, Matthew McConaughey, Ariana Huffington, Seth Godin, Dan Pink, Deepak Chopra, these people... They had, it was their sixth book that hit it, not their first five. You never saw their first five books. It was their ninth sitcom. It was their fourth movie. It was their 800th tryout. At, to a T, 
these 300 people, you can map them almost algorithmically how many years they toiled building behind the scenes a blog that no one ever read or knew about. Well, maybe they, maybe they read it, knew about it, but it wasn't leveraged. And then five years later, they had 80,000 subscribers, 15 a day for five years. They launched a book and everybody bought it. Next thing you know, you see them on the Today Show. And you think that they're all of a sudden a celebrity. They worked their ass off for 10 years and you never saw them. Is that these people were not overnight successes. They labored in obscurity, most of them, until they shot on the stage and you have no idea what it took them to get there. It's a commonality amongst all of them. I mean, look at you. It took how many episodes to get a guy of my stature? And now your podcast <laughs> is like exploding as a result of my humility on air. This was your promise of your PR person. So yes, that's what we're banking on. Scott Jeffrey Miller, let's make it super obvious. We can make sure you retire in Park City in a new, bigger house. Where can they find the videos? All the videos you put out that I found so valuable. Okay. You can go to greatmentorship.com, greatmentorship.com. That's the website for the book. And there is, you know, a dozen plus videos on there you can watch. And you also obviously can buy my, my books wherever books are sold. All seven of them, well, six right now, the seventh book called Career on Course launches in February. But honestly, again, Bradley, I appreciate your spotlight and your abundance mentality being such a raving fan and giving energy to my book. I'm grateful to you. I appreciate you coming here. Really enjoyed learning from you and in a separate life too. We'll have to talk about your agency. By the way, you help speakers get on keynotes. Well, that's my business. I'm a talent agent. Should I be representing you? Should you be a speaker in our, in our speaking agency? I mean, and this there's small, thing. dark basements with 12 people. Yes. You got it, bro. You should be keynoting more. <laughs> Pays well. And this book you're laid on. Maybe I should be your literary agent. Maybe I should be getting you a big book deal. You should own the big house in Park City. Why don't you... Skip picking up your child and help me build a better career. This is just an idea we could record. Uh, we're not. We're going to close it out. Scott Jeffrey Miller. Appreciate you, man. Thank you. All right, then, friend. How did that go? I didn't oversell it, did I? No, I didn't. So check out his work. Buy a case of this book, The Ultimate Guide to Great Mentorship. You're not going to regret that. Not a chance. Also, go check out his website. Fantastic URL. Great mentorship.com and follow him on Instagram. It's Scott Jeffrey Miller. He's got the little blue check mark, but I don't know what the hell that means anymore. However, a lot of people follow him and for good reason. He does a really good job of blending the personal and the professional, sharing some insights, sharing some humor, sharing what's happening within his family. He does it really well. And I was just kind of looking through and I've been following him for some time and he weaves these all in from different angles of his life in a very authentic way. And I think you can learn from it as well as enjoy it. So if you did get value from this episode, please rate and review us. That means more to us than you know, as we look to reach a broader audience to bring us all closer together in the construction community to build better, build safer, and more profitably. All right, friend, that's all I've got. We're going to close out like we always do with our leadership mantra. You, my friend, are owed nothing. Deliver value first. Make it a great week.